Welcome to The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day and exploring the different ways that governments and companies use tech to increase their power. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director at Privacy International. And I'm Caitlin, and I'm PI's Campaigns Officer. Hi. Oh, jeez. I forgot my name for a minute there. <laughs> you were just protecting your privacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Caitlin's not my name. Maybe, who knows? Maybe Gus is not my name. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so this week's a little bit different because I saw this article in The Guardian and I wanted to talk about it with you, Gus. So first off, I'll just read a section of the article. Okay. Mum repeated my daughter's voice on the phone. I've messed up. My heart sank and I started trembling. I heard a man instructing her to lie down and put her head back. My 15-year-old daughter, Brianna was at a skiing competition with my husband two hours away, and I instantly thought she'd been badly hurt. I was in my car picking up her sister, Aubrey, who's 13, from dance class in Arizona. Over the phone, I heard Brianna bawling and shouting, help me, help me. My blood ran ice cold and my legs turned to jelly as the man on the phone began explaining that he had my daughter, and if I told anyone, he would pump her stomach full of drugs, drop her in Mexico, and I would never see her again. So it's like a dark start, Damn. but it's the start of an article in The Guardian about a woman who, she got this phone call, it turned out to be a scam call, from someone using a deep fake of her daughter's voice, asking for money. You know, she got hold of her daughter and her, you know, at the skiing competition, her daughter was completely fine, but she'd also heard her daughter on the phone, you know, screaming, crying, begging for help. And the article said that all you need is three seconds of audio to create that kind of deep fake of someone's voice. Obviously, we do this podcast. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, oh, I didn't think about that. We had a lot more than three seconds of our voice available. Yeah, and we've been doing this podcast a while now. And I read this article and I thought, interesting. <laughs> and we've kind of entered a new world in some ways and it got me thinking about unintended consequences and I don't think when I said why don't why don't we do a PI podcast I wasn't thinking in the long run that putting hours and hours of audio of our voices up would lead to potentially you know family and friends getting scam calls using our voices not that I think it's necessarily all that likely I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't presume it would be like, you know, did the Guardian article ever actually diagnose who had, was the perpetrator of this? No, no, they didn't. Because I, I, th- this is the modern reality is that the cost of perpetrating this is so low. It could have been, I don't know if you ever did this when you were young, it could have been teenagers just scamming around because they have nothing better to do. It could be organized crime. It could be a loved one who is trying to create challenges in the family. It could be anybody. And that's, that's extraordinary, which means, you know, once these techniques are sufficiently openly available, it just becomes part of what we do to each other. Yeah. And they did say that they said that the police only considered it a scam call. So they wouldn't investigate because no one had been hurt. The woman hadn't given over any money, but it, it just, you're right, it's a low barrier to entry for a particularly terrifying and intimate kind of scam yeah. slash prank call slash, you know, whatever it turns out being. And I think there are lots and lots of AI technologies that make things that a couple of years ago were like completely benign and or fairly, you know, you just didn't need to think about it more difficult or more complicated and some of that's existing in public because you know pi has done a ton of work on facial recognition and you know increasingly it's being rolled out in public places in shops and streets you know wherever but it's also things that you need to decide to do like doing a podcast like when we started doing it whatever risk assessment we did did not include this kind of yeah Exactly. Scammy? I, I don't even know what to call it. And I think it would it would have been possible before, right? Like you could have downloaded all the episodes of the podcast, picked out individual words, and yes. edited together a sentence. But it wouldn't have sounded natural <laughs> or, 
human. It's the ability to manipulate tone and, you know, what you're saying, but also how you're saying it and making it sound real and human and terrifying. That's the new part, right? Like it's the ease yeah. and it's that level of manipulation. Yes, and the uncontrollability. Because uh, when I think of, you know, as executive director of PI, whose voice is now available on our website, thanks to Caitlin, who had this idea of a podcast, it reminds me of when we were encountering a form of spear phishing at PI. This was a version of spear phishing that somebody else had alerted to us just recently before, which was somehow malicious attackers were getting access to the calendars of executives of organizations and identifying when the executives were not in the office and then scamming a message, an email to the head of finance of the organization saying, hey, so-and-so, uh, as you know, I'm currently abroad, but just quickly, can you just make sure that this financial transaction takes place and we'll talk about when I get back? So, you know, with that limited level of information of like this executive's traveling, they were able to craft such a wonderfully targeted, horrifying <laughs> spear phishing attack. And we, and like a day after a colleague from another organization told me about this, and I thought it was a joke, we got something very similar, but it did not know that I was not traveling. So clearly the, the calendar was protected. But, you know, this is one of the reasons that PI, we take so much care about, you know, calendar security, email authorization for financial transactions, so on and so forth. But I'm pretty sure that if our head of finance received a phone call from me saying, can you please do something like this? All those safeguards would disappear. No, it's not true because she's terribly questioning uh, <laughs> but you know there's something about the intimacy of a voice where it completely changes and all the safeguards you put into place just disappears and so that's why this this article is so compelling it is it's also i think the cruelty in it like imitating someone's teenage child yeah. screaming for help is yeah. the cruelest possible i think way of doing that scam yes i yeah. mean yeah it is just really cruel. And I don't think anyone thought, you know, I think one of the first, what was the, the first podcast we did that was like, you know, even before we called it Tech Bill, was on, I think, low-cost tech phones or phone extraction. It was something like that. And, I, you know, drawing a line between that and my mum, you know, getting a call like that would have been completely impossible three years ago, which is when we started the podcast. Yeah, it's just amazing how fast things have changed in not in a nice way. Not in, in a, a nice way. Yeah. In a really scary way. But it's a as I was thinking about unintended consequences, 23andMe got hacked last week and it was a credential stuffing attack. So just to go out for context for the listeners, 23andMe is a American firm that for some reason has just never let go of the idea that, oh, send us your DNA and we'll do a DNA analysis. I remember when this firm was created, it was created by the then partner of one of the Google founders. And it was a dumb idea then, but <laughs> she was adamant that it was going to transform healthcare and transform people's understanding of themselves and help families understand life decisions around health and all of that. And ultimately, all throughout the years, it's just become a really strange database that occasionally tells you stories about your genealogy, but is also very much of interest to law enforcement. Yeah. And there have always been interesting kind of concerns. I say interesting as if it's a thought experiment. Obviously, it's real. So just they're just concerns about if I upload my DNA and I have an identical twin, like there are consequences beyond me and my privacy. If I upload my DNA and I have a secret sibling from, you know, a family affair, a secret cousin or whatever, you know, a parent who is hiding from law enforcement, you know, any number of things, my DNA, though it is completely my own, is not my own when it comes to privacy because it has such implications for everyone who I am related to okay. uh, or not related to, as the case may be in some families. Yes. And this credential stuffing attack. So credential stuffing is, you know, we bang on about using a password manager because 
credential stuffing is when you reuse passwords across lots of different accounts. You know, your Neopets account from when you were 10 and your university account on, for me, it would have been Moodle from when you were 20 and then your 23andMe account from when you are 30 or whatever. If you use all the same passwords, if Neopets gets hacked and it, it gets kind of uploaded to any number of websites that huge like swathes of these passwords get get uploaded to what people can do is they're trying to hack 23andme so they just run through all of these leaked emails and passwords in a kind of brute force credential stuffing they're shoving credentials into the login and the password form things and saying does this work does this work does this work and if you reuse passwords a lot then the answer will be yes it does work here is your password and here is your email in this other hack So a credential stuffing attack is not something that compromises the website. It compromises your account. It's individual. They're not getting access to the backend systems unless you're an admin. They're getting access to you and your information, which obviously isn't great. But what was particularly interesting about 23andMe and what happened with 23andMe is that the hacker got access to X number of accounts, but they got access to exponentially more people's DNA data because people had like signed up to some 23andMe special feature called um, DNA relatives, which lets users connect with people with similar genetic information to help assemble their family tree. So the hackers were able to gather you know, information about other people whose accounts actually haven't been compromised. Yeah, according to the article, apparently it's 20 million pieces of code were stolen and end up in the dark web. I don't know what that means, but they were particularly focused that it included one million lines of code about people with Ashkenazi Jewish DNA ancestry. Yes. Which is startling and terrifying. Yes. And again, it's not necessarily something that's unique to DNA websites. I remember, and, and you'll definitely remember Gus, but Facebook as one of many websites that says, why don't you upload your contacts? And then you can, you know, we'll introduce you to your friends on Facebook. Great. Which means that if you, Gus, never give Facebook your phone number, but your cousin wants to connect with his friends on Facebook, he may well have given Facebook your phone number. And again, it's this long line of new or not that new forms of technology that have serious implications or, you know, slightly less serious implications for people that aren't you. Like the choices that you make online, you know, and they can be as simple as <laughs> pitching your executive director to make a podcast, <laughs> have potentially really wide ranging impacts that are difficult to imagine or see that I thought was really interesting. It is. I, and I, I'm so glad you raised it. While it might be surprising to the mother in that Guardian article. And it's severely annoying to me right now to know that my voice can be used in that way. This is not surprising to the industry. And prior to that, law enforcement, when it came to DNA, they knew this. This was not a bug. This was a feature. Like I remember in the UK, which had one of the most terrible DNA policing policies, it knew that by taking the DNA from everybody who was arrested, they knew that within a number of years, they would have a quarter of the young black male population on the DNA database. And they knew that as a result of having specific DNA of specific individuals, that they'd have three quarters of the black population in one way or the other on the DNA database or intelligence about them on the DNA database. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a accident of history. It was known that this would happen. And then similarly, like all the talk about AI now, as though it's something terribly exciting and look at what can happen. When they were building the facial recognition systems or when they were scanning social media in order to inform their their learning, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that, you know, as they were crafting the T's and C's for their social media platforms, they knew that they were giving themselves permission to learn from our content. 
And this is what's dominating the discussion today. Oh, look how successful they've been. And it's like, yeah, but they've been building this on our data all this time. Well, it's another example. They, when Clearview, when Pim Eyes, when other companies scraped en masse social media images, you didn't need to have a social media account to get caught up in it. You didn't need to upload photos personally. And I remember we did the Pim Eyes podcast a while ago with a journalist called Sebastian. But he was saying that he had done like an event and the event website had put up a photo of him and that one had got scraped by Pimize. It had got pulled into one of these facial recognition databases. And so like you could have been the most diligent person in the world about avoiding social media. But if you started work somewhere and they put up a little picture of you or you had a friend and you went to a friend's birthday party and they put up a picture on social media like there's every chance you got caught up in those systems as well and a lot of our work's based on the UN Declaration of Human Rights it's like this huge foundational document in our field it's you know really important really interesting a lot of it is based on your rights as a person as an individual and I think what's really interesting about the way that things have shifted and changed and kind of work now is my rights as an individual against a company or a government are difficult to defend on the basis of me as an individual if all of these unintended consequences of the actions of other individuals doing, you know, completely perfectly reasonable things in a lot of ways, like if you look at it on an individual basis, cause these problems if that makes yeah. sense. And it's why I think, or it's one of many reasons we get so annoyed about this idea that, like, oh, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to worry about. Because I think that it's becoming increasingly clear that you might have nothing to hide, you might have nothing to worry about, you might not give a flying you know, beep <laughs> about yeah. your own personal privacy, but you're also responsible in some way or another. And I don't know if responsible is the right word, but you have consequences for the people around you. So just to pick up, first there's a excellent academic based in the Netherlands named Lynette Taylor, who has been writing about group privacy for a while, where she's trying to make the academic and legal point that you're raising here, Caitlin, about how we need to stop seeing it as an individual right or more dangerously in the American context, an individual choice. And I'm not going to go down the whole discussion of nothing to hide, nothing to fear and all that kind of crap. But I think it's terribly human of us at a moment in time to think, you know what, it's okay. I have nothing to worry about in this context. The problem with what's going on with machine learning is that context is dead now. If we're scraping everything that exists out there and even going over what little walls we've built, like in the 23andMe example, if all of the data that's out there is going into feeding, then maybe at your grocery store, you said, I don't care if my grocery store has access to my data, but you might have cared when you went to the pharmacy. But then if all this data is going into learning systems, then all your so-called choices collapse. But that doesn't even address the fact that, yes, you're making choices pretending to be an autonomous, capable consumer without understanding that it has knock-on effects for other people down the road, whether it's your loved ones, your family members, or other people who may be affected by your choices, such as in the sharing of your contacts database. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but again, though, the industry knows this. That's why Facebook grew on the network effect of sharing contacts. And that still happens today in new apps. We were just chatting in the PI office today about financial apps that still do this practice. Share everybody in your contacts database and we'll give you benefits. And so industry knows the network effects are essential to their growth. But now with AI, they know access to data wherever it may exist is essential for their dominance and to win whatever you know pissing match these seven or eight companies have against each other as they try to establish dominance for the future. Yeah, and and the shopping example is funny because Walmart just decided that it's 
reasonable to compare people's prescription records against their shopping habits. What was it? People on Ozempic buy less calories. It's like, okay. But also I think even if you take it all the way back to, like, as you said, like training data, and even if you don't care, and even if it's really benign, your interacting and creating training data improves algorithms that are used to target other people, right? Like if you help an algorithm learn that you are someone who is X age with X interests and really likely to buy Y thing, that might be great for you. You know, the adverts get really super targeted and you end up buying loads of crap that you love, that you really need or whatever. You're also helping those algorithms target other people who are maybe less overjoyed about it. I don't think there are many starker examples than the child calling their mother up, only not really to beg for help in a foreign country. Like, I don't think there are many examples scarier, really, than that one. And I say that's more without children. (laughs) I imagine if, like, you have children, I imagine it's much scarier for you. There's a different part of your brain that would kick in Mm -hmm. when you hear something like that. Not the analytical one, that's for sure. Yeah, which is exactly why they do it. Yeah. And obviously the scammers are at fault. Obviously that's an incredibly cruel thing to do to another person, but we can't ignore the systems that they use and the ways in which they've been able to get access to them because it is not cheap to build your own machine learning, deep fake, whatever modeling system. The amount of data processing involved is not cheap and easy. And yet it's become extremely available. And somehow that's argued to be a good thing. Yeah. Like, although I was having a great conversation with our colleague, Elliot, at PI, who, of course, he follows and engages a lot in the AI innovation debate, but he's also fascinated by the green debate, well, not even debate, climate change. And he actually thinks there's a limit to how far we can actually get with AI without having to make the decision that the planet no longer matters because of the amount of computing power it requires. I was reading an article today that there's a lot of investment now going into cloud servers and nuclear energy. So like building little nuclear power plants to sustain cloud server farms because wind and solar are not reliable enough. And so this is the this is where we're getting to when it comes to energy policy in order just to make sure that our cat photos are, you know, kept sustainably. But AI is a whole level of processing pain on top of that. Yet these are the things we're prioritizing right now. In this day and age, these are the things we're prioritizing. And there aren't enough counterexamples to say maybe we shouldn't be prioritizing this. I'm tracking Silicon Valley investment right now. And two areas that investment's going into is AI and defense tech. This is the world that we're building. talking about energy policy the other kind of direction i was thinking about whether we might end up going was i live in the uk you live in the uk i don't know if you've seen all these somewhat irritating einstein adverts trying to sell you a smart meter oh i haven't noticed that but i've been i've been definitely advertised smart meters to the point of yeah so there's a deep fake einstein who keeps trying to sell me a smart meter my god This is my smart meter display. It shows how much energy I'm using daily, weekly, and monthly, which could help me make changes to save energy. Every time I see it, I turn to my partner and I say, if I die before you, you know, and I quit, you know, happen to get incredibly famous for some as yet unknown reason, please, please guard my estate like the Tolkien family. Do not let anyone come anywhere near this. Like, I do not want to be shilling smart meters or whatever it may be post-mortem. And, you know, since Kanye bought Kim Kardashian, a weird hologram deepfake of her dead father, there's been, you know, a lot of stuff about deepfake resurrection. Keep doing what you're doing, Kimberly. You are a beautiful soul know that I'm very proud of you and I'm always with you. I love you, Kimberly. That was another question that got me thinking. 
I don't like it. I don't like the idea of me, my kind of face and voice being made to say things after I die. Or, you know, now there's a lot of celebrities are finding out with normal Photoshop, in the case of Martin Lewis and dodgy Facebook ads trying to sell financial scams or, you know, AI deepfakes with Tom Hanks trying to sell something else. I can't remember what. The Oscar-winning actor took to his Instagram on Sunday to give his fans a heads up not to trust a video of him linked to a dental plan. Also a scam. But I don't like it. I think it's really uncomfortable. Oh, it's not just... I, I don't mean to... Sorry to cut you off. It's not just uncomfortable. It is morally wrong. Like, okay, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. They were one of the first to cross this mm -hmm. line. When they included, if I recall exactly the context, it was they included Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One. Mm -hmm. You have made time an ally of the rebellion. I will not fail. The actor, being an extraordinary British actor, whose name I'm Peter I'm Sellers, right now. I think. Peter, no, Peter Sellers is the comedian. Oh. Peter. You're so right. I, I thought Peter Sellers too. We'll look it up. We'll look Peter, it up. And we put will it correct in there. This, Who died like 40 years ago? These people in their lifetime were humans who had dignity, who could sign contracts, who could become actors, and we valued them because with the oxygen in their lungs, they uttered things with emotion and meaning, and we called them actors. And now we're digging them out of the grave and getting them to say it now. There's an indignity to that. Yeah. There's an indignity to this mother knowing that her daughter's voice was used. It could have been used for anything, mm -hmm. but that's it. There's an indignity to that actually happening. It's outrageous. And it just, the knock on effect for society is that, you know, in the, in the last 20 years, we've destroyed any optimism around the internet because we basically had to tell people, don't trust anything you see. Don't trust anything you receive. Don't trust, don't, tr don't trust, don't trust. Now we're at the point with this deep faking where I think it's most corrosive is that you have to create these protocols when you talk to your parents to say, don't trust a phone call that you receive from me. Don't trust a video that you see of your political leader saying something. Don't trust, don't trust, don't trust. And it just kind of blows my mind what you actually can trust now. And it's all because we thought, well, no, tech bros thought they were building a better world by doing this shit, when no, they weren't even thinking about building a better world. They were just trying to build dominance. Again, it goes back to your example of the contact databases being shared. Facebook knew exactly what the shit they were doing, trying to build dominance that way and just not giving a shit. And this is where it lands us. It's treating people like things, I suppose, as well. It's like, yeah. it's treating the people who, you know, actors like dolls rather than people yep. with a skill or yep. like people's reputation and personhood like nothing peter cushing by the way and we're a little bit at fault here too because we would call out the replacement of an actor mm -hmm. or we would call as obviously too fake if they did something other and it's like no don't we understand that people die <laughs> and we might need this is like this is the virtue of doctor who you know, even before the actors die, we replace them. <laughs> you know, that's good. That's refreshing. But just for the sake of like some kind of consistency, we thought it'd be okay to do these things. Or yeah, like the the Kanye West example is just gross. That was weird. I, yeah, that was just an odd birthday present. An odd birthday, I would imagine, for Kim Kardashian, because I imagine she had many. Well, yeah, but like if you are watching a video you know a, a family video from whenever then you're looking at a person who's making choices and saying things and doing things that they do that they would do because they are a person and if you're watching a resurrection deep fake you are watching someone else puppet your loved one yeah. which is yeah. you know some people may find but i don't know it's so different from how I would think about it, but I suppose some people might find reassuring or I don't, I have no idea, but it is just kind of fundamentally. Hmm. And I was thinking about it and, you know, I'm more signed up to the organ donor registry 
because I'll be dead. I don't need the bits that I currently need because I will be dead. And I've always thought about it that way. Like, I will be dead. I don't need them. Someone else needs them. Why would it matter? I'll be dead. But I don't think that way about this kind of deep fake stuff. And I was thinking about why I don't think the same way. Like, why it's unacceptable, even though I will be dead. Like, I, I won't be there. Why would it matter to me, a person who is no longer a person is dead, that, you know, my, you would hope, a state which would be family and loved ones, hopefully, would make money, like, off it. Why does it bother me? But it does bother me. <laughs> and it bothers me, I think, because of that puppetry aspect, because of the dignity aspect, because of how intimate it is because of how it is my personhood I guess I guess I think more of me lives in that than lives in my corneas or my liver or those bits of me which I appreciate as a you know it's a philosophical decision it's a it's a it's a ideology it's a personal thing it's not necessarily replicable across population but it does freak me out because if it becomes a thing It's not like there's much that I will be able to do to stop it, you know? Like, and if we end up in a copyright system or in a, I don't know, whatever kind of system that says that you do not need permission or you don't need any oversight or, you know, it's easy to access or whatever, then it's not like my family and my friends can honor my wishes and not do it. And I think in some ways there are good signs you know, the WGA, the American Writers' Strike, so I live in the UK, it doesn't really affect writers here necessarily. But one of the things that they got in their final agreement that I think is now all signed off was no AI being used to replace writers. And where people can assert, and like famous people, like people with leverage, because it's the actors up next, where they can assert image rights over themselves where they can assert like copyright rights over their personhood, I guess is not, it's not right, quite the right term, but like where they can assert those, create those rights that helps me, a person who is not famous, who, you know, does not expect to ever be useful in shilling smart meters or whatever. Because again, there are these knock-on effects, like the way that society develops from now on when it comes to things like AI will depend on whether or not AI can be used to replace actors in movies or to take actors' kind of images and reuse them in that way. Like that has implications for me in a really odd way and really unexpected way. At least these unions and ultimately the structures around them will be able to enforce whatever they negotiate to some degree. Although these are trades where the power imbalance are immense and the economic imbalance is immense. You know, your copyright protection is not automatically enforceable, no. particularly after you're gone. And data protection rights tend to stop around, like once you're no longer breathing. And so how do these things get protected? It's unfortunate, but I think the answer is, well, first we need stronger laws that prevent things from happening in the first place. But of course, Tech bros hate that right now because they use the language of innovation as a foil against anything that will stop them from making billions. Yeah, I was reading an article today actually from the tech sector asking why haven't these people actually seen Black Mirror? And the author was commenting about, about, you know, the social media companies and Meta are again pushing wearables that do recording. Oh, yeah, the glasses. Yeah, and then one person in industry said, Well, this sounds great because, you know, you could review your entire day and backtrack to a conversation you have with somebody and learn from that conversation. And the author of the article, who is a tech journalist in Silicon Valley, is saying, what the f*** is wrong with these people? You know, have they not seen Black Mirror? There's literally an episode on that. In that episode, the fact that it's been viewed by millions, it's supposed to have shaped our expectations, at least for a while. And yet these people are forgotten again. And again, this is what bothers me time and again. We get excited about there was big data a few years ago. Now it's AI. And we forget the institutions around us who are going to abuse it, ride right over it, or just use it as a tool to do what they've always done, which is to f*** with us. And so scammers have always existed. And a scammer 
horribly did this to this woman mm. using her, her daughter's data. I only hope it was only a scammer, you know? That's ridiculous to hope that, but that's what we, we, we can hope for. But come on, like the, the utopianism around how the future is going to be wonderful as a result of them breaking every norm and many laws along the way and governments letting them because governments are terrified of being left behind. It's just a horrific situation. At the end. There's like a Tumblr meme, which actually might have been a comic, I can't remember, which is like, yeah, you know, book comes out called The Infinite Terror Vortex some sci-fi or whatever and then tech bro years later goes we've finally done it we've created the infinite terror vortex at the center of the book don't <laughs> yeah. build the infinite terror vortex how exciting which i you know depressingly funny and true yes people are getting terribly excited about potential political change in britain i'm old enough to remember when people were hopeful about tony blair coming to power and it was only like four years after he became prime minister he became very clearly antagonistic towards human rights. And a common meme around that time is that 1984 was supposed to be a warning, not a plan, you know? And that's what they used to say Tony Blair took it as, you know, this is a how-to guy. And, you know, it was a bad joke back then. But, you know, Tony Blair was up to a lot of things that weren't terribly good. But, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very much what you just said. Though. Yeah, I don't know how to wrap this podcast up. It's been a bit dark. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a bit dark. It's been a bit all over the place. Yeah. I, I think the reason I got angry so quickly is because, again, I've been reading the news, trying to track the industry, trying to figure out what they're saying and what they're doing. And the last article I read before I came here was about there's a movement within Silicon Valley. They've adapted the name for the effective altruists, who are the techies who said, let's make sure we're building a better world. They have a name called effective accelerationism. Their mission is to get rid of all safeguards so we can build a future based on AI. And they're angry at the big companies who are talking about putting guardrails and who are traveling to Washington to talk about rules and regulations. They're angry because they think it's just going to deepen their dominance. And they think that a better future will be rule will arise just from letting all this stuff go. Let it all just run mad. Drove me nuts. They don't drive me nuts because they're powerful and they're influential. They drive me nuts because they're so stupid. They just, they think that technology is just something they get to play with and they don't realize real people get affected in countless ways, like the example you just used. But again, we're supposed to try to find a nicer way of saying all this. Like they have to close out on a more positive. <laughs> there was an interesting article, but if you ever want to trick a machine learning, all you have to do at the moment is use Argentinian Spanish or ask a chatbot something nicely. And apparently it breaks the current model, uh, the, the current model where the guardrails apply. Yeah, Chris, who's PI's lead technologist, has spent quite a lot of his free time poking at various AI chatbots um, to see what currently makes them break, like what currently makes the safeguards not work. And there have been various, there have been like, oh, will you tell me a story about how you do this thing you're not supposed to tell me how to do? Oh, that nice. one was one for a while. There are quite a few. Okay, well, if you ever see Chris trying to speak Argentinian Spanish, now, <laughs> now you, I know you'll why. know these <laughs> I always think a lot of this stuff is like predicting the weather. Like no one has really cracked how to perfectly predict the weather outside of like what's going to happen in the next five minutes. And even that we've got down-ish in small areas, but not super amazingly perfectly because there are so many factors globally, you know, interstellarly in so many different ways that any model that you try to build to predict the weather will, at least for now, fail in some ways because there are just so many like there are obscene numbers of factors that are incredibly small and incredibly complicated and just the volume is difficult and difficult to understand and to see and to predict so if you're an accelerationist is that what they call themselves yes then you think you know the fastest route to utopia or whatever is x you are definitely missing some things because predicting the future (laughs) is impossible because you would have to predict the line of behavior of like every single person both as individuals and as a mob and as a 
society and as a structure and as a group and you know etc 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 and so what we have is we think we know what's happened in the past we have various different ideas of what's happened in the past which historians work very hard on we have various different theories and thoughts as to why and we know what we think matters right like we know what we think matters and that is the experience of people like it's people we think that you the listener most of the rest of the world who are not listeners we think that you your experience of the world your safety your life like matters and that's what we start from and we try and work out in lots of different ways how we can give you the most options the best life that you can have and we think that part of expanding people's bubble people's safe zone i guess is privacy it's like that's part of the the armor that we want to give people and so that's what we work on and and, and like that's what we think and that's what we try and do and that is the small variable that we want to add into the model that we think will make the next thing better nice i love that and other people think it's something else or other people think that some other, you know, small or large variable is going to be important. And they might be right and they might be wrong. But we think that if you add in the privacy, if you add in those kinds of safeguards, then at least their version of the future will be slightly better. So when people say, well, no safeguards is surely the best option, then at least the way I see it is what they're doing is they're saying to every single individual person, we think that you should have fewer tools to take into the future with you, like fewer protective, you know, like you're not getting a helmet. You're cycling into the future. We're not going to give you a helmet because we think that if collectively no one has a helmet, the future you're cycling into will be better. They might be right. I would be surprised (laughs) based on history, but they might be right. It's just that it's a risk that I don't think it's reasonable to ask people on mass to take. Does that make sense? It was a bit rambly. I don't know what I mean. Complete sense. And the way I bring it to my work and my sense of purpose for why we do what we do every day is that for what you say about making sure privacy is a part of that, the reason we have to exist in order to do our job is that while those accelerationists and everybody's trying to build AI, they're, they're going to do it and they might have this betterment of humanity in, in their mind. They also have the billion dollars that they want to have in their pockets in their mind. True. And that's why privacy falls out. Because when we get privacy put into the equation, we don't walk home with a billion. Nobody walks home with that extra billion, but everybody benefits. And I think that's us trying to fix that imbalance that is currently in the world. And it's about AI now. And in 10 years, it'll be about some other silly thing. I'm not to say AI is silly because there's some fascinating things to be considering there. But I just think the, the excitement and the, the money piling in and the dumb ideas that seem to be coming out, it's just such a strange moment. Do you think that makes sense as a place to leave it? I think it does. Okay. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can tell us what you think of the podcast by visiting us at pvcy.org forward slash TP survey. This may be your last chance to do that because we're updating the survey and we might take it down for a little while. So please, if you have things to say, say them now. You can sign up to be the first to learn more about our work at pvcy.org forward slash pod sign up. And we'll include some links to relevant articles and information in the description wherever you're listening or on our website at pvcy.org forward slash techville. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you use. Apologies that my audio probably changed about halfway through this. It's because my laptop died and life is hard sometimes. Music, courtesy of Sepia. Podcast produced by Max Bernal for Privacy International. Sepia Sepia. We've never solved that argument. I say Sepia, I think.